Good morning, everybody. My name is Andrew Whitty. I'm the Chancellor of the University of Nottingham, and it's uh, an enormous pleasure to have the opportunity today to make a few introductory comments before our new seventh uh, Vice Chancellor of the University uh, delivers her inaugural address to you all. Uh, we're being uh, transmitted to the campuses in Malaysia and China, so welcome to all of those who are watching there and also across the uh, campuses here in Nottingham and Sutton Bonnins and elsewhere, people are able to watch uh, through live stream. We're hoping that we'll get plenty of questions uh, toward the end of the session, not just from in the room, but also from people watching remotely. So we'd encourage you to take advantage of the various technologies, Twitter and else, uh, other types of technologies to send your questions in uh, for Shira to address. Before I introduce Shira properly to you, I'd like to make just a few uh, general introductory comments. Uh, a time of transition of leadership in the way that the University of Nottingham has just gone through with the retirement of Sir David Greenaway and the appointment of Shearer is obviously a moment where people often look back and, and reflect on achievements. And if we look at the achievements of the first six vice chancellors of this university, uh, it's quite extraordinary to see the way in which the University of Nottingham has developed and grown physically in terms of its presence here in Nottingham, uh, globally through its presence in Malaysia and China, and through its capabilities and its achievements in terms of Nobel Prizes, its contribution to science, its contribution to arts. All of those are extraordinarily important things to be proud of, and probably something that Jesse Boot, who facilitated the creation of this building that we're in today, some 90 years ago, could never have imagined but would presumably have been incredibly proud to see happen. But universities aren't museums. And looking back is important because it gives us our roots, it gives us lessons to learn from, it gives us history, stories, myths to be inspired by. Uh, but it's really about the future that a university should be fixated. A university should be a cauldron of energy, a cauldron of of capacity, of thinking, from minds of all ages, not just the young, but everybody who wants to be applied and has the potential to really make a difference to the way in which we as humans, we as people, think about the future, think about our environment, think about the potential of what we can achieve together. And that's what a great university should be continuously fixated on, its future how to create that kind of energy, that kind of environment. There's never been a more important time, in my view, for institutions like the University of Nottingham to step up to that challenge and not to dwell in the past and not to in any way be complacent about the past and not to look backwards, but to really try and drive forwards. We're in a very dramatic environment today. We're a confluence of many different tectonic plates shifting in unpredictable ways. We're coming to the end of an era dominated by the baby boomers, an era which has influenced much since World War II, but now clearly coming to an end. We're in an era where a world which was designed for Western Europe and the United States is coming to an end as fully 7 billion people on the planet find a voice through mobile technologies, travel, and other ways in which they can be part of the global community in a way in which they never have been before. We're coming to the end of a world of specialization, of silo thinking. We're coming into a world where the connections that people can make are going to be just as important as the content they understand within a particular subject area. And all of those different pressures are exciting. They create great opportunity they create risk. We can see the kind of friction points that those shifts create. It's a long time since we've had such a great challenge around whether or not being an expert is actually a good thing or not. It's one thing to criticize an expert, it's another to undermine the notion of expertise. That's a very dangerous place for a world to start to drift toward. It's a dangerous world when we no longer think fact-based decision-making is the way in which we should make decisions. Those sorts of challenges are symptomatic of a discomfort, a nervousness, the inevitable 
greyness which somehow happens when we have so many of these shifting plates going on and uncertainty about what the future really holds. Will there be enough jobs for everybody? Will those jobs be equally distributed? Will we continue to be able to develop a more inclusive, more diverse society? Will we be able to look after the people we need to look after, not just those people who can look after themselves? Those concerns drive fear into a system. So the world that we look at going forward has many, many opportunities of geography, of scope, of technology, but it has risks. And all of that is there because we happen to live at a moment in time when these plates are moving in a way they haven't moved for maybe 50 or 70 years. Now that really speaks to the power and the importance of the universities. And great universities like the University of Nottingham have an extraordinary role to play at moments like this, far more important than in, let's say, the more steady times. It's a moment where inspiring the people who come into contact with this university, whether physically in a classroom or a lecture hall or whether remotely through online learning, whether here in Britain or in Malaysia or China or anywhere else in the world, have this great opportunity to try and create a sense of inspiration, of positive energy, of solutions rather than simply dwelling on problems, finding ways to work together rather than against each other. And that's why, actually, a change in leadership, a new Vice-Chancellor here at the University of Nottingham at this point in 2017 is perfect timing. Because the next decade is going to be a different decade to the last. It's going to be a different set of challenges for the reasons I've just laid out. And the university, like all great organizations and institutions, craves leadership at that point in time, leadership which is going to go through the whole journey. And we're so fortunate that at this university, because of the achievements of the past, because of the foundations laid by the first six vice chancellors, the university had the opportunity to really find the best in the world to come and lead this university. Somebody who could truly represent in her own self some of the characteristics that I've just described. Not somebody from a parochial British background, but somebody truly global. Not somebody just Nottingham, but somebody who's worked at the elite universities in the world, including Oxford, Sheffield, Birmingham, others. Somebody who's grown up in a different academic system in the United States. All of those personal features represent important elements of background which I firmly believe will contribute to strength going forward. To have the first female Vice-Chancellor of the University of Nottingham is something to be incredibly proud of at this university. As we continue to demonstrate in every way possible that this university is about inclusion, diversity and giving opportunity to people, whatever their background, whatever their interest, whatever their religion, their sexuality, gender. All of those messages are so important that we continue to look for ways in which we can do better and better at how we can reflect the world. But most importantly, in Shearer West, I think we have a new vice chancellor who, in addition to having great intellect, great track record, great impact in all of the different places that she's been, also has a steeliness, a steeliness to, to get things done, to be objective, and to be thoughtful about what's right for the long-term health of this institution. Today isn't a traditional installation. You can probably tell that because I'm not wearing gowns and nor is Shearer. But this is an important moment. An inaugural lecture is really something in the tradition of how an academic would enter an institution. And it's a perfect way for an, an academic of excellence, Shearer West, to introduce herself to you and to give you a sense of perhaps the vision that she sees for the future of this university under her leadership. This is probably the last time I get to talk to you as Chancellor of the University of Nottingham, but I could not have been happier for my last opportunity to talk to you 
to be my chance to introduce your new Vice-Chancellor, the seventh Vice-Chancellor of this great university, Shira West, to you for the first time. Shira. Thank you for that very generous introduction, Andrew. Chancellor, colleagues, students, distinguished guests, Tuan Tuan, Puan Puan, Salamat Patong, Ni Min Hao. It's a tremendous honor for me to be here today and to be able to address you as the seventh president and vice chancellor of the University of Nottingham. I want to spend the next 45 minutes giving you my thoughts about the place of global higher education in 2017, and I'll be echoing many of the things that Andrew just said. I want to recognize the University of Nottingham's many successes and achievements, and to lay out my vision for where I think we'll need to go over the coming decade in order to build on this rich heritage. Before I begin, I want to pay tribute to two of my predecessors, Professor Sir Colin Campbell and Professor Sir David Greenaway. Between them, they led this university for nearly 30 years. That's an amazing record. Sir Colin was responsible for ensuring that Nottingham was, was a first mover in developing overseas campuses at a time when very few universities worldwide were contemplating this. And Sir David has overseen the growth of those campuses, the development of an outstanding educational offering and student experience, and a deep and sustained engagement with our alumni community. Building on their legacy and moving us forward through these exciting but nevertheless troubling times is both a daunting task and a huge <coughs> privilege for me. I look forward to working with all of you on that endeavor. Andrew mentioned the past. Um, I want to begin with the past, with the origins of the university. As someone who studied history, I recognize that every generation builds on the foundations of the previous ones. And the legacy of Jesse Boot is something that I see everywhere I go. As he stated when he donated the land on which this university was built in 1928, thousands of students yet unborn will pass along the corridors and learn in the lecture rooms and wrest the secrets from nature in the laboratories. Their work will link still more closely industry with science, add to the honor of the city, and help to increase the well-being of our nation. And we can go further back to the civic identity of the city, to the ambitions of the late 19th century that inspired Jesse Boot. Uh, University College Nottingham, which is pictured here in the slide, was a sort of Wunderkammer, a kind of cabinet of curiosities, which embraced both academic and technical education, a natural history museum, and a public library, all in a single building. Such structures have played a strong role in our university's history. When the Trent Building was erected in 1928, the Architects Journal praised Morley Hoarder's design for recognizing from the outset that he was building a modern university and not an imitation of a medieval university. So taking these various origin stories together, we can see that the University of Nottingham was founded on the values of comprehensive education, and partnership with industry and the local community, as well as being forward-looking and committed to both new discovery and social engagement and impact. All of these things are part of our foundational values, and I feel that we need to remind ourselves of them regularly as we move forward into the choppy seas of 21st century higher education. So the higher education landscape that we're witnessing globally would have been completely unthinkable 20 years ago. The scale of universities worldwide, the multiplicity of their missions, the intensification of competition, both from the Asia Pacific region and from private providers are some of the changes that we've witnessed over that period. And we've also seen a rapidly changing employment market with new skills required, Universities playing a significant anchor role in their local communities, particularly as budgets are cut to public services, and students increasingly perceiving themselves as customers 
and challenging universities to provide value for money. The rise of mental health problems, pressures on free speech, and scorn for expertise are only a few of the many major cultural issues that are affecting universities throughout the world. So we need to use our imagination and our energy to address all of these challenges. But in the UK, we're also undergoing a barrage of media and public attacks. At the moment, it's not possible to open a newspaper without finding ourselves in the spotlight for all sorts of negative reasons. From allowing or not allowing certain speakers or sculptures on campus, to the pay that vice chancellors receive, to allegations of poor value for money, or bad student behavior. The individual complaints, whether or not they are justified, accumulate to make it look as if universities are failing in every possible way. But to counter this, the Universities UK and the Russell Group have pro provided significant evidence of the contribution universities make to society and the economy. UUK has made strong arguments about the innovation of our research and the skills we provide to ensure a more productive economy. And a recent report by London Economics Consultancy Group has demonstrated that the Russell Group universities alone contribute 86.8 billion pounds per annum to the UK economy and are responsible for 261,000 jobs. And that's only 24 universities, and we have 166 universities in the UK as a whole. However, facts and figures such as these appear to have little value in the emotional environment in which we're currently operating. So where do we, as the University of Nottingham, place ourselves in this complex and anxious world? I want to spend the rest of my time this morning talking about a vision for Nottingham's future that builds on our distinguished heritage and positions us for continued success. My vision is for Nottingham to be a university without borders, where disruption is seen as possibility and where ambitious people and creative culture will enable us to thrive. We represent ourselves as the UK's global university, and the values that we share recognize the importance of looking outwards in a world where a com combination of social media, global industries, and the ease of travel bring us all closer together. When the Malaysia campus was founded nearly 20 years ago, universities were much more parochial places than they are now. Extending our reach overseas had elements of both welcome cosmopolitanism and perhaps rather more problematic imperialism. Today, however, we're in a different situation. Global, in many parts of the world, has accrued negative connotations. And we're witnessing greater levels of protectionism in many countries that, at its most extreme manifestations, can engender xenophobia and hate crime. So it's more difficult to be global in the same way that we used to be as our cosmopolitanism has become tarnished by anti-elitist rhetoric and the disenchantment of members of the public with the unintended negative consequences of globalization. So how we evolve our global positioning requires us to consider even more than in the past how we break down the barriers with our local community, with our alumni, with our partners in industry, the public sector and charities, and how we can use our digital strategy to compensate for any obstacles to staff and student mobility. We need to be at the forefront of thinking about what global means in an anti-global world. And to achieve this, we can draw on the lessons of history. I'm going to do some art history now. I'm an art historian, so you're going to get a bit of art history today. We're living in what Klaus Schwab has called a fourth industrial revolution of ubiquitous computing, artificial intelligence, smart cities, wearable technologies, and advances in robotics. However, we can look back to the first industrial revolution of the 18th century, which coincided with the Enlightenment, a period of new thinking, changing political and religious belief, and scientific revolution. This is uh, Joseph Wright of Darby's, by the way, a philosopher giving a lecture on the Orrery of 1768. 
The Lunar Society, which was a quintessentially Enlightenment institution, was a Midlands phenomenon that drew together philosophers, scientists, engineers, inventors, and makers to explore the changing world together. At that point, as today, boundaries between the academy and society were broken down for the sake of developing and delivering knowledge to a changing world. David Hume, in his essays, Moral, Political, and Literary, distinguished between what he called the learned world and what he called the conversable world, that is, the academy and society. And to Hume, the worlds of the ivory tower and of society needed to come closer together because he felt, quote, learning has been a loser by being shut up in colleges and cells. A contemporary version of, of the Lunar Society resides in the significant partnerships we already have. These partnerships fuel research, they provide opportunities for our students, and they catalyze innovation. As a top performing research university, we need to think carefully not just about how we contribute to develop these strong partnerships, but where we need to focus in future in order to ensure that we both enhance the quality of what we do and that we deliver for society in a variety of ways. So boundary breaching comes in the form of how we work across as well as within disciplines to face the challenges that the world is throwing at us. It recognizes, and I stress this very strongly, an ecosystem that embraces the entire spectrum from fundamental research to innovation, from pure discovery and knowledge to training for professional practice. This ecosystem is what makes universities so valuable, but it's only by working with our students, our community, and our partners that we can realize the full value of what we do. Strong relationships, I feel, are best developed bottom-up and by people being able to have face-to-face -face contact with each other. Brian Schmidt, who is a Nobel Prize winner and is currently Vice-Chancellor of the Australian National University, has stressed the importance for early career researchers in particular to be able to work with the very best in their field wherever they are. And this often involves spending time in a country not their own. And, uh, and Schmidt was very much saying this is how we create the next generation of Nobel Prize winners. In the more protectionist and closed environment that I referred to earlier, those opportunities for mo mobility, for physically moving from one country to another, could well be made more difficult than they've been in recent years. And if that happens, we need to work for ways to ensure that border controls and obstacles to the free movement of our staff and students are compensated for in whatever ways we can. This is going to require both influencing public policy whenever we can do that, and deploying a variety of opportunities for short duration in-country experiences, plus using the technology tools we have to support that. When I talk about being a university without borders, I'm referring to the ways in which the many achievements of the University of Nottingham, working in partnership with others, have already been instrumental in breaking down the barriers between our beautiful campuses and the society in which we live. Here I can point to evidence from the UK, from China, and from Malaysia, of where we've been able to make a difference in terms of the health and well-being, economy, culture, sport, and education, not only for our students, but for stakeholders outside our physical perimeters. I know that we share many of these attributes with Nottingham Trent University, and that our contributions are complementary and reinforce each other, and it's good to see the Vice Chancellor of Nottingham Trent, Edward Peck, my former colleague, here in the audience today. So I'm gonna spend just a few minutes um, shamelessly boasting about things that the University of Nottingham should be proud of. So health and well-being represents an obvious example of porous boundaries between our university and our community. Nearly 50% of our medical students and over 70% of our nursing and midwifery students remain in Nottingham or the surrounding region. The caring community that we, we foster throughout the world has engendered a volunteering culture in China that sends students and staff to work in impoverished rural areas and in Malaysia helps raise awareness of how we can support the UN's Sustainable Development Goals. The Cripps Health Center on our campus, which will include a new building thanks to the generosity of the Cripps Foundation, has a list of more than 41,000 patients and is the largest GP register in the UK. 
The new center will continue to provide a service for staff, students, and for the community, as well as fostering more clinical research collaborations, leading to improvements in healthcare. The economic significance of our university is also demonstrable, with 5% of the local economy and 14,000 jobs driven by us. I'm sure that the work we've done with businesses and local government in the city and county, and drawing on our close relationship with the Ningbo provincial government, have contributed to the value of trade between China and the East Midlands, increasing from 250,000 per annum well, in 2006 to 1.3 billion in 2016. In terms of culture, we boast an outstanding cultural quarter in Lakeside Arts in the Ginogli Gallery, which have had over two million visitors since 2001. Our Nottingham New Theatre is the only student-run professional company in England. Our engagement with the UNESCO City of Literature Initiative, with our staff and student community work around poetry and creative writing, enrich our quality of life, as does the University Philharmonia Orchestra and other ensembles. It's deeply regrettable that recent events have taken such a negative turn against the UK's engagement with the European Capital of Culture bid, because I've been very truly impressed with how, very, how well the various cultural organisations, the universities and the City Council have worked together to support this bid. In addition to our cultural partnerships, we've had extensive interactions with our community in terms of both sport and education. The David Ross Sports Village opened last year has not only made it possible to offer more participative and elite sports to students, but also to enable greater engagement with local school children. The Tri-Campus Games have taken our strengths in sport around the world and have offered excellent opportunities for students to engage with each other. We're pleased to be able to sponsor or co-sponsor three local schools in the UK, as well as working with a migrant school in China and building capacity of teachers throughout Zhejiang province. In Malaysia, we've provided an opportunity for the first two students ever from the Orang Asli indigenous community to receive a British education. So that was my boasting. But all this boasting is really to demonstrate that we are already, to an extent, operating as a university where our borders are porous, where disciplines work together, where staff work with students, and where we collaborate with a range of partners both within our own communities and throughout the world to ensure that we are delivering to our charitable goals. However, there's always more that we can do. Part of this is about our mindset, and ensuring that we continue to challenge ourselves to get out of our colleges and cells, as Hume would put it, and to see that we have myriad roles to play locally, nationally, and globally. This is not to deny that our core business is research and education, but to see how that business sits in a bigger context. The history of university shows us that this has been our purpose for centuries. The ivory tower is quite a seductive concept, but even Cardinal Newman, in his idealistic idea of a university, recognized that the purpose of the university was not to serve itself. And you can see his very inspirational quote here, that cultivated intellect helps make people more able to discharge their duties to society, wherever they happen to be. So I feel it's important that we work tirelessly to break these boundaries down further to transcend the challenges that anti-globalization has thrown at us, and to overcome the suspicion that our publics have developed about our purpose and aims. So given that we operate in a globally connected world, I think it's also essential we use the tools available to us to assist with that engagement. And this brings me to the second tier of my vision for Nottingham University, where I refer to disruption as possibility. I use this statement deliberately, deliberately as a positive statement, although this is not the way disruption is frequently portrayed. It's inarguable that in the last 10 years or even five years, our way of life has changed largely because of developments in smartphone technology, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. It was within close living memory that we used landlines, typewriters, and CD players and that we walked around the streets folding and unfolding our maps, or sat on the train reading a newspaper, and now we just look at our phones. 
The rapidity of these changes has brought, has brought out futurologists to predict the end of the world as we know it, and they often seem very gleeful about that. So only a month ago, I listened to a lecture by Glenn Davis, the outgoing vice chancellor of Melbourne University, who posited that universities were heading for overnight dissolution, not unlike the monasteries under Henry VIII. This narrative of the death of the university has been around uh, since at least the mid-1990s and probably way before that. And I'm going to actually go against the tide and challenge it. So I'm going to indulge myself in a bit more art history here and refer to one of my research interests, which is the art of the late 19th century. In the last decades of the 19th century, the so-called Second Industrial Revolution saw rapid advancements in manufacturing, infrastructure, telephone technology, and electrical power, accompanied by a combination of dystopian angst, millenarian gloom, and a global mental health crisis, indeed not unlike the one we're experiencing now. I've studied the art that emerged during this period and included such masterpieces as Munch's Scream, uh, Ensor's Entry of Christ into Brussels, uh, I don't have time to explain what that's all about today, uh, Van Gogh's Starry Night, and G.F. Watts's Hope, all of which speak to the end of the world, futurology, that dominated fin de siècle Europe. At that time and afterwards, some things certainly did change forever, but other things survived. I have every confidence that universities are going to survive the fourth industrial revolution, as they did the first, second, and third. However, universities have survived a thousand years by adapting, and we are now under pressure to adapt more rapidly than ever before. So here are some of the facts that lead me to be confident. The OECD is showing that the number of people going to universities has been expanding, rapidly increasing, even while we have had constant predictions that MOOCs, Google, and other technologies are going to drive us into obsolescence. It's worth noting that recent arguments about value for money in universities, which have been made uh, very publicly, have been about students wanting more face time with their lecturers and a better student experience, not necessarily more technology to replace the human contact that education provides. Although machines can learn by themselves if they're properly programmed, the majority of people are not autodidactic. The number of people who begin to study MOOCs and fail to complete them suggests there's always going to be the need for human facilitation to help support students in how they learn, not least to navigate the infin infinite amount of data and information that we now all have at the touch of a button. However, I think it is very true that we now have tools that we didn't have before, that we're able to do things that we couldn't do before, and that I accept we may be nearing saturation point with the campus university as we know it, with greater limitations on the affordability or desirability of constant physical expansion. I also recognize we're operating in a world where the workplace is changing due to the rapid technological breakthroughs of the last few years. On this latter point, it's worth looking at the World Economic Forum's assessment of how skills needs are changing and what students entering employment will require in 2020 as opposed to 2015. So this study didn't cover expert technical skills, um, but it's, it's definitely true that we're going to need more highly trained STEM graduates to provide the deep knowledge that's required to operate in a world of driverless cars, cyber terrorism, robot surgeons, and genome sequencing. But what this list tells us is that we're also going to need more people who are creative, who have emotional intelligence, who can think critically, and who are comfortable with complexity. Our new world of work is going to require everyone to use both their left and right brains in order to thrive. This means we must continue to examine critically both our curriculum and our pedagogical methods. In terms of curriculum, the new uh, interdisciplinary liberal arts and cancer studies degrees that we've developed are just two examples of how we're already turning our attention at the University of Nottingham to this changing world of work. 
So how do we take the skills challenge into pedagogy? Now, there are different views of whether flipped classrooms actually lead to better educational outcomes, but there is little doubt that students benefit from a virtual learning environment as a supplement to lectures, seminars, and tutorials. That more personalized learning is now expected, and that this is only possible using sophisticated data analytics to ensure that support is tailored to the individual. And that we are only at the beginning, only at the very beginning, of what virtual reality might do for us in terms of such subjects as architecture, medicine, and engineering. And here again, we can build on the University of Nottingham's notable successes, which in educational quality and innovation was recognized by the award of a gold in the teaching excellence framework, whatever you might think of that exercise. We've introduced the Nottingham Advantage Award to provide additional credits to students for everything from evening language learning to peer mentoring in maths. Our Students as Change Agents project gives students the opportunity to co-produce educational and research outcomes with members of staff. Problem-based learning is widespread. I've been going around the university and seeing this everywhere, all over the place, and taking problems and working together, students working together to try to resolve them. And we've increased the number of internships and placements to enable students to experience the workplace as part of their degree program. The work UNMC is doing in Bangladesh and the ASEAN region is using a combination of short course delivery and Moodle content to upgrade the capability of English language teaching in a deprived part of the world. So when I talk about disruption as possibility, I'm thinking about how we can make more use of a combination of digital and physical resources. How we can bring our alumni to assist us further in providing both mentoring and work placements. How we can begin to diversify our educational, educational offering and look more to the opportunities for lifelong learning by providing higher apprenticeships on the one hand and by developing and expanding our CPD and digital delivery on the other. I'd like to see how we can explore new opportunities for both student and staff mobility beyond the whole semester or full year experience. And so the question is, how do we do all that? That's a lot to do, a lot to think about. And this come down, comes down to the final component of my vision for the University of Nottingham, and that is around people and culture. I cannot stress enough how people are the most important resource that we have. I remember speaking to staff at the University of Christchurch in Canterbury, New Zealand after the devastating earthquake in 2010 that saw loss of life and destroyed much of their university infrastructure. That's quite an extreme example, but it was the people who kept the university going through that devastation and through the post-traumatic environment that they had, to re they, they had to rebuild the university. So let's look at the volume of our human talent at the University of Nottingham. We have 45,000 students, 9,000 staff, and more than 250,000 alumni living in over 195 countries across the world. That is quite an astonishing figure. Um, if you add all that together, it is the population of Pittsburgh. And this is more than just a set of numbers. Our people do every job that exists. On our campuses, we have cleaners, gardeners, doctors, data analysts, lecturers, technicians, counselors, nursery nurses, poets, lawyers, accountants, farmers, and athletes. Among our alumni, we have leaders in all the professions and who contribute to public life, industry, policy, politics, culture, and charities throughout the world. This is a very diverse group, ambitious, committed, and successful, and we should be very proud of being part of this community. But to ensure the continuity of the success of the University of Nottingham and the delivery of our mission, it is absolutely crucial that we cultivate a culture of equality, diversity, and inclusion. Although strides have been made, there's still some way to go here. A significant amount of research has demonstrated that diverse teams lead to higher performing organizations. But I also passionately believe that the principles of diversity should be prioritized in an open, democratic society. 
And to me, diversity is not just about gender, ethnicity, and other protected characteristics, although these are obviously crucial, but about belief, background, nationality, and life experience. If we can celebrate and harness a culture of inclusion in our university, this will make us a more successful place. And it's particularly important, I think, to promote these values in a world where public life has become increasingly uncivilized, as divisions in society have become exacerbated. So this is about people, which to me are the most important thing. But I also want to draw to a conclusion by focusing on how we can develop our culture to ensure that we can deliver a university without borders, where we capitalize on the possibilities of a disrupted world and draw on the immense talent pool I have just described. So for the last bit of my talk, I'm going to be a little bit provocative, but this will no doubt give us plenty of things to talk about in the coming months. I look forward to arguing with people about some of the things I'm about to say. I'm going to categorize what I see as the prevailing culture, not just of our university, but of many other research-intensive universities, particularly in the Western world. So here you go, deep breath. <laughs> I'm going to present this as a series of six couplets. Um, I'm a humanities person, so I think like that, that demonstrate both the positive and negative aspects of what I see as the Academy's cultural norms. So first of all, and as I've mentioned already, we're building on more than a thousand years of tradition there were institutions of training in Asia and Africa as early as the 800s. And in Europe, the University of Bologna dates its foundation to 1088, when it became the first place in the world to use the term universitas for a community of students and teachers. So the flourishing of universities over such an extended period of time is a testament to the institution's resilience. But the downside of tradition is a tendency to conservatism and risk aversion. It's interesting for me to note that when I visit our campuses in China and Malaysia, where universities have not been around for quite so long as they have in Europe, I see quite a different approach to both tradition and to risk. So the second cultural quality I'd like to posit is the power of an individualist ethos in universities. It's this that fuels curiosity, inquiry, debate, and analysis. It's what leads us to produce groundbreaking monographs and creative outputs. It's responsible for, for Nobel Prize winning revelations, such as the late Sir Peter Mansfield's discovery of magnetic resonance imaging. But the negative side of this remarkable individuality is a tendency towards entitlement, where we pay more attention to what the university does for us inside it than we, than we do for what we're doing for the rest of the world. Related to this is the way in which a knowledge-based organization full of clever people can ensure that when there's a problem, there can always be a local solution found. However, this can lead to what I call drawing uh, very liberally on anthropological thinking, normalized weirdness. And, and I'll describe what I mean by this. This is the behavior, the attitudes, the processes or actions that seem perfectly normal to anyone inside a community, but appear completely bizarre to someone from the outside, whatever the outside may happen to be. I think this exacerbates an us and them approach in universities, where people embrace understandably the familiarity of their local systems, processes and practices, but they also can tend to scorn those of others. So back to art history now to illustrate my next point. I'm going to refer here to sculptures that were commissioned by guilds in Florence in the early 15th century to celebrate their patron saints. So Nanni de Banco's Quattro Santi Coronati was commissioned by the wood and stone workers, Donatello's Saint Mark by the linen weavers and peddlers, Brunelleschi's St. Peter by the butchers, and Ghiberti's St. Matthew by the bankers. Now, all of these sculptures were intended to be displayed in niches at Or San Michele, a centrally lo located church in Florence that became the chapel of the trade guilds. Now, you know, might not know where I'm going with this, but to me, these guilds are the Renaissance version of our academic disciplines. 
They were full of pride. They were competitive. They had their own standards, habits, practices, and methods of training. So you could read economists, engineers, vets, and historians, rather than bankers, stone workers, butchers, and peddlers. And don't try to match those up exactly together, please. <laughs> These strong disciplinary communities are hugely valuable to a comprehensive university like Nottingham. But guild pride becomes problematic when it leads to intolerance of other disciplines or unwillingness to cooperate. So the niches of Orsan Michele symbolize for me the silos that we create for ourselves. The pronoun we can too often be synonymous with people like us. In the borderless university world that I've described earlier, advancements in research and curriculum development require people willingly to step out of their guild silos from time to time, not always, and work with others. So while we're suffering from a period in which scorn for expertise permeates our populist world, I'm personally convinced that, the, that expertise is one of our greatest strengths. That's one of the greatest things we have to offer as a university. However, the downside of, of this level of expertise is the seriously high bars we set for ourselves and the fear of failure that goes along with that. We need to become less frightened of failure, seeking to experiment more frequently, fail fast when we do fail, learn from that, pick ourselves up again, and carry on. And I'm sh just to tell you what the, w the works of art are, that's Thomas Aikens's Gross Clinic. It's not because it's a gross clinic, it's because that's Dr. Gross in the clinic. And, um, and that's uh, Henry Fuseli's uh, 18th century drawing of um, an artist in despair at the magnitude of antique fragments. You can never achieve uh, that uh, level of greatness. So my final couplet has, relates to the way we govern ourselves. While a university like Nottingham has grown way too large for all decisions to be made by the polis or the body of citizens, we still have an ethos that respects the role of Senate to set academic standards and agendas for research and education. This is a positive quality of universities that has been somewhat lost in recent years, but still exists more prominently in our institutions than just in just about any other large organization. The downside of a Republic of Letters style of governance is that change can be sluggish, that decisions can't be taken until they win their way through layers and layers of governance, and that we're therefore unable to be as nimble as we need to be to address these new challenges that continue to face us on a daily basis. So I've just drawn you a picture of universities that should be read against the synthesis I gave you at the beginning of my talk about global higher education. We have a rapidly changing, demanding, and highly competitive landscape. And we have a university culture that will either help us to thrive or will bring us down. What we need to do at the University of Nottingham is to accept that change is going to continue for the foreseeable future and that it's going to happen more rapidly than ever before. Uh, one of my favorite books about universities, which many of you have probably read, is uh, Francis Cornford's Microcosmographia Academica, which was written in 1909. Cornford was a Cambridge classicist, and every word of it is still true. So Cornford, uh, I, I'm just putting Cornford's quip here. There's only one argument for doing something, and the rest are arguments for doing nothing is supported by his assertion that fear of the unknown and fear of change are endemic in a university environment, and somehow we need to work to overcome that. So I believe we have, should have a culture that enables us to be courageous, imaginative, and agile in relation to change, that builds on all those positive things about university culture that I mentioned earlier, and eschews as far as possible the negatives. But if we look at our changing environment and our maturity as an organization, we have the ambition as an organization to move in the direction of being a strategic enterprise. While the tendency to react badly to pressurized and changing environment is potentially driving us back towards tribalism, and somehow our ambitions and where we're going are not coming together quite the way one would hope they would. So we're not helped by this by the burden of compliance and accountability that's placed upon us by a myriad of external agencies and by the competing expectations of our funders, whether they're government, industry, or students. 
If we're not very careful, this is the thing I'm, what keeps me awake at night, our Trojan horse is going to be an office for students that micromanages everything we do, rather than rightly ensuring that we provide the best possible education for our students. So what do we do about it? I feel we need to create an environment where we, where we strip away as many bureaucratic burdens as we are allowed to, and where our decision making and respects principles of subsidiarity with all the implications of responsibility and accountability that go with that. So if we look at our institutional organogram, it may look something like the one on the left. I, you don't even have to see what's in those boxes to get the idea here. It appears very hierarchical. But in truth, we operate in a complex organization where human relationships matter more than structural models. How we unlock the power of that complexity without losing a sense of vision and purpose is what I feel we need to work together to achieve. And I'll, I'll leave this up just for a minute because it's so, so fun to watch. I hope everybody's seen the computer says no in the middle there. Um, um, <laughs> It's been said that universities usually lag 15 years behind private corporations in their ways of operating. So I think we're just about in the right place in terms of that timing to develop a sort of creative culture that's been responsible for so many of our recent technological breakthroughs. While this is much easier said than done, it seems to me that our future success depends on it. So I started with Jesse Boot, and I want to end by reprising his inspirational quotation. While I will never be able to be so eloquent as Jesse Boot, I decided to try to sum up my thinking about a university without borders, disruption as possibility, an ambitious people, creative culture, into a single quotation. I'm very proud indeed to be the leader of a comprehensive university with the history, research achievements, and educational excellence that characterizes the University of Nottingham. So I end with the thought that Nottingham, as a comprehensive university, does not need to do everything, but that we have the capability to do anything. Thank you very much. Well done. Thanks. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Shira, congratulations. I thought it was an excellent uh, lecture. Uh, realistic, provocative, energizing. I think uh, anybody who's in the room or listening uh, will surely. Uh, feel a, a wind of change coming to the University of Nottingham. So I think congratulations on delivering that very beautifully Thank done. Thank um, and even improved my art knowledge in the process. So <laughs> terrific. <laughs> Low bar as far as I'm concerned. Um, we've got time now to uh, really cover some questions. Uh, can I ask in the room, if you have a question, please put your hand up. What we're going to try and do is ping pong between the room and uh, online. So bear with us as we try and include people from all over the place. Uh, so in the room, first of all, uh, there's a question, uh, middle, a lady just in the middle there? Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, Maybe you could tell us who you are in one sentence, not your whole CV, and then <laughs> um, your question. That's Helen, isn't it? Hi, um, I'm Helen Foster. Um, I'm, I work in the Office of Global Engagement. Uh, yeah, my question is about the overseas campuses, um, and I'd just like to ask uh, what your first impressions were I know you visited recently, so I just wondered what you felt when you saw those campuses for the first time. Well, the, f the first time I went to both campuses was September, and I've been back again since then, so I've seen them both twice. And I have to say that unless you've been out there, you can hear about them, but it's overwhelmingly um, positive impression that I got from the campuses. Um, they, they're, they're very different in, in their sort of culture and, 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 you know, and, the, and the sort of whole student life and, and the way they work. They're very different to the UK campuses. But I feel that, um, I, I think that they're amazing places. And I, one thing I, that I slightly worry about is that the UK, China and Malaysia 
tend to compete with each other a lot. And there's a, there's a good side to that competition, but there's also a downside. And I would just like to see more mobility, more people even visiting for very short periods of time. So we get a lot of mobility, China, Malaysia to the UK, students and staff. But maybe we could do more about getting staff and students, not for long periods necessarily. Um, our head of communications just went for just a week, and I think learned a lot in that period of time. Great. Thank you. Tim, do we have a question maybe from China, since uh, we're on the topic of the international campuses? Uh, thank you, yes. Yeah, thank you. Yes, I've got um, a question from uh, our Ningbo campus from Professor Kui Ping, who's a professor in advanced materials at uh, science and engineering. And again, it's just a follow-up, really. Uh, do you have more detail on what your first impressions of the Ningbo campus was like? And um, any more specifics on what your future vision for the Ningbo, Ningbo campus would be? Well, I think that the, qual the quality of the work that's being done on the campus, both in terms of research quality and in terms of the quality of the students um, who are coming there and what they're doing after in terms of employment and further study is quite astonishing. Um, I think in terms of the future of um, the, the Ningbo campuses, I think some of the work that's already being done, because we're, we're fairly maxed out in terms of um, how big we are on that campus, is to look at the relationship between undergraduate and postgraduate education, to look at the mix of programs and see if we've got that exactly right, and to just really have a good look at all of that. I think that's already being done. So. Great, thank you. Uh, in the room, on the right-hand side, a gentleman just halfway through. Uh, John Holford, I'm Robert Pierce, Professor of Adult Education. Um, uh, one of the very interesting points you've made has been the, uh, the need for what you, I think you phrased it, disruption as possibility. I'd just like to, uh, uh, but you, and, you, and you've also alluded to the importance of us working well with the communities. I'd really like to ask how we're going to uh, rebuild uh, a connection with the community of an educational kind, given that one of the great disruptions of uh, the University of Nottingham over recent, over the last two or three decades, has been a lot of the removal of that, those kinds of close connections which we had with, um, th with the local community. It's worth saying that Nottingham um, was, Nottingham, as, as, as you know, I'm sure, was founded in the uh, late 19th century. Gladstone, when he laid the, the foundation stone of the university, referred to the importance of lifelong education in the community, and that's something which we have very much moved away from with the closure of our continuing education provision. Thank you. Um, I, I think you, you, you will have seen, I mean, I, I think our relationships with the community here, um, you know, we can always do more than we do and we can always continue to work on them. I think that I won't, I don't want to mention other places, but I think they're better here than they have been in other places I've been. Um, and I, so I think we're building on good foundations. In terms of lifelong learning, I really do feel that that's an area that has been recognized in policy circles as, as something where we've, you know, particularly in the UK, we've got behind, you know, we've gone backwards in that at a time when actually we need it more than ever before. And you will have heard me mention in my um, talk that I think this is something as a university we need to think about very imaginatively. What is the next generation of this and how can we contribute to it? and how can we lead on it. So, thank you. Next question. Yes, please. Uh, yeah. So I'm, I'm Chris Denning from, um, from Division of Cancer and Stem Cells. I was really encouraged to hear you talk about risk and, and the pace of change and things like this. I was having a conversation with a colleague at the Burnham Institute just recently in the US, and he was grumbling that each year they only had $40 million of, of, um, of funding that came from philanthropy. And that was lower than the Salk Institute, who had $70 million. And of course, in our context, that's, that, that would be a beautiful gift. And the reason why they thought that was so important is because there weren't strings attached to that money. It was, it was money that they could use to buy equipment or they would see the next big thing and they would leap straight onto it. Whereas in the UK, we have to apply for funding and then maybe 18 months later, we get it through and we're behind the curve. 
And so I'm interested to hear your thoughts about how we might try and address that so we can move more rapidly. Yeah, I think, I think that is a perpetual dilemma because I think there's, there's several things packed up in all of that. Um, I mean, we, we, the money we get often does have strings attached to it. And we, you know, this is the compliance burden I'm talking about here. So we have to just accept that. If we have a funder, there will be expectations. I mean, I, I, I'm sure this is true in the US as well. Maybe not for those particular um, groups of, 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 of scientists. But um, so, I, so I do think that we have to do that. But on the other hand, what I do know, because one thing I, you may or may not know about me, I worked in the research councils for four years, is that people apply for grants and they say what they're going to do. And if, it, if it's successful, they do a whole bunch of other stuff that they never said they were going to do. And so I think we have to expect that if money is given for something, that there are going to be outcomes, and those outcomes are going to, to have a big contribution. And, and what we might think is going to happen at the beginning is not what happens at the end. I think the main thing is that we have some idea of where we're going with it, and that we know that we can you know, give back, as it were, or pay back in some way to whatever science research communities from what we've done. But I think that's, I think it would be interesting for us to look through, you know, we're, we're doing it a bit now with the value for money questions. How much money are we spending on compliance out of student tuition fees? And we're not the ones who make those rules. So we've got to balance that out somehow. Great. Tim, uh, another online question maybe? Thanks very much. Yes, we got a question via email from our Malaysia campus. Um, Marie-Thérèse Leroux, Assistant Professor at the Bangladesh College Education Development Project, which you, uh, you mentioned in your lecture there. Uh, congratulations on your appointment, which is heartening to all women in the arts in academia. Uh, what actions will you take to promote the arts as a field of study in our UK, China and Malaysia campuses? Okay, thank you. I mean, I think there's some good... I mentioned the liberal arts degree that we're having here, and that's only one thing that's happening. But I think there is a lot of imagination in the way we're, our arts are developing here that I think we can bring all of our campuses into to address those skills needs that I mentioned earlier on. Promoting the arts... I, I, you, know, I've, I've, I'm a, I, you know, I'm a humanities scholar myself, I, and I, 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 I do feel very strongly that we have to be very positive. And, and there is a tendency, because things haven't been so easy for our disciplines in the last few years, to get too entrenched in a kind of victim mentality. I think we have to avoid that at all costs and just really shout out about all the great things that we are contributing to research and to our students' education and to society and not not be shy about that and, uh, you know, because every discipline is suffering some kind of pressure now. Scientists have different sets of pressures than people in the arts do, but we're all, we're all under a lot of pressure. So thank you for that question. Good question. Uh, way at the back, um, I think, yeah, chap in the white shirt. Hi, I'm Daniel Goldstein. I'm first year and I'm with University Radio Nottingham. Um, my question pertains to kind of Nottingham's role as a global university. You spoke about expanding culture and making sure we have an impact of creativity on that. How are we going to do that and how are we going to do that in spite of kind of the, I don't know, a, a, a divisive uh, yeah. global environment that might inhibit that? Well, I mean, that, that's a question I'm, uh, as you saw me wrestling with that question myself in my talk, so, it, so it's a very good question. And I think it's, it's it, it, what, accept the things you can't change and change the things you can. I think we have quite a lot of work to do, um, particularly in the UK campuses, on ensuring that we have a culture on our campuses that respects that inclusion and that internationalism. And I have discussed, for instance, with the, um, with Alan, the, the student union president, about, you know, about what, when we have 27% international students, how do they feel when they come here to what is a very different environment, and how do we create a, a, a culture and an environment that embraces all of our students wherever they've come from? And I, I do think we have quite a lot of work to do on that as, as a university community, and I don't have all the answers. That, there are a lot of clever people out here I'm hoping are going to help me with finding the answers to that. So thank you for that question. Um, I have a question um, yeah, at the centre of that room. Uh, 
Uh, hello, I'm Oliver Warlow. I uh, represent uh, 1,100 undergraduate students in the Department of M3 as their academic rep. I'm a current student here. Uh, I was just wondering, in a changing culture of uh, students as consumers, how do you plan to protect the um, individualised experience that students have from becoming a purely transactional arrangement? Sorry, can you repeat the question again? I didn't quite catch all of it. It was something about transactional so individualization. As, so as students uh, encounter a changing culture uh, where they become effectively consumers, how do you plan to protect the individual experiences that students have at university? Um, and how do you plan to keep that from changing to a purely transactional arrangement? I okay. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I, I, I wish I, I wish I, I were uh, had you know were omnipotent and could give you or, or and could make all that happen. I think at the moment we're getting a we're getting a lot of tension between. I mean, personalised learning is something that we're very committed to developing, um, to making sure each student you know their personal experience is the best experience that they can possibly have. And when you have forty five thousand students, that becomes. You can only do that in very slow steps. Um, I, I would really, really regret. We have, I feel this university has really good relationships between staff and students. I would really regret if all the changes in the policy landscape led those relationships to become purely transactional or contractual. I think it would lessen the experience for students. It would make a university, uh, 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 you, you, the, the memories and the pleasure you get out of, and the, and the challenges you get out of being at a university will, will be lessened by that. And I, I just think we're going to have to work. I don't know what's going to happen with the Office for Students. It may be very good. It may help us improve our student experience and educational you know, outcomes for students. It may help us do that. But um, the danger is that, that students more and more will feel that they're in a contract relationship with us rather than a human relationship. Sure. Can I? So, in your comments and, and in that answer, you yeah. haven't shied away from from surfacing, you know, some of your anxieties around the policy framework yeah. and, and the like. Um, yeah. You're just taking over as vice chancellor. Have you had the chance to think through how much time you're personally going to spend engaged on the national policy debate, which might take you away from the university yeah. physically, versus? So can you just talk us through a little bit how you're thinking through the first year or two in sure. balance of yeah. work? Well, I'm a new vice chancellor, and the last two who were here a long time knew the university very well. I absolutely have to get to know the university well and intended and intend to prioritize the early part of my tenure on the university globally. Um, that doesn't mean I can take my eye off the ball of, um, of our external relations of various sorts, policy development, our industry engagement, our alumni. And so I think it's a matter of proportion of time, because both of those things have to be done in the early stages. But um, I, am, I, am, I, I, come, I came through a policy landscape in an earlier part of my career, and I still have a lot of connections with it, and I intend to use those connections to help in whatever way I can to influence um, what's happening. Not, not that I personally will be able to make the changes, but I think we just have to keep attempting to influence. Right. Great. Thank you. Um, question way, about two thirds of the way back on the right hand side. Yeah. And then the next one will go to Twitter. Hi, um, my name is Philemon. I'm a final year PhD in immunology. I wanted to ask um, about the university's um, vision for Africa. There are lots of African students in Nottingham, and this June, when we helped organize the first Africa conference here in Nottingham, we had about 300 African students and speakers coming to engage and I wanted to find out if there's any vision at all um, for the university in about probably establishing a campus in Africa or having partnership with African universities. Thank you. Thank you. I mean I can't give you a vision now but what I can tell you is because I'm still very new in the job um, but what I can tell you is, is, is what, we're, um, what we're planning to do. Um, we're, we're having a really good look at how what our global engagement, global partnerships, and global student recruitment looks like. And I think we're going to need to think about uh, what we need to develop in different parts of the world over the next few years uh, compared to what we've done before. And that may mean making some changes of emphasis, changing of focus, but it will mean we need to have some kind of strategy for each part of the world, whether it's in terms of our research engagements, 
or student recruitment. So um, I, I think that that's the only thing I can tell you now, but it's a very good question. Thank you. Great. Tim? OK, thank you. Yeah, we've got um, one from Twitter from the UK, actually, now. Uh, Stacey Johnson, Associate Professor at the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences. Uh, you emphasise the importance of diversity in your lecture. Uh, can you share some of your practical ideas about how you will realise this uh, in your, your clear commitment to uh, equality, diversity and, and inclusion at our university? Um, it's early days for me, as I said, but I can give you some of the things that I, I think we need a strategy around this or a, a, really, a really strong focus around all of this. But I can, it, I've been asked about the practical things, so I just want to name a few things that are either in the offing or already being undertaken. Um, Marion Walker, who's the Associate Pro Vice Chancellor of Equality and Diversity, um, has been tasked to oversee a process of reviewing our recruitment procedures to see how, whether they are you know, fit for purpose in terms of how we operate across the whole spectrum of a recruitment process um, with equality, diversity, and inclusion in mind. Um, I, have, I am beginning to work with Sarah O'Hara, um, the Pro Vice Chancellor of Education and Student Experience, on considering the BME attainment gap, which I feel like we, all universities in the UK have seen to be having some of this, and, and, and I think it's not, uh, we, it's not appropriate that we have it, and we need to understand it and do what we can about it. Um, I have mentioned earlier on um, my conversations with the Student Union President, Alan Holy, on the international student experience, uh, which I think is something that we need to move forward. And uh, I, I haven't told them yet, but heads of school, I don't know how many are in the room, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call a, have a, a workshop with heads of school early next term to talk about equality, diversity and inclusion in succession planning. So it, it, uh, what, your invitation will be arriving at, on your desk soon. Mm -hmm. So those are just a few practical Good. things. That's great. Thank you. Uh, questions in the room? Uh, yes, yeah, about four rows back on the right here. The My right wing is... seems to be outvoting the left wing at the moment. So <laughs> I'm actually <laughs> sitting on the left wing from my point of view. Okay, no, I'm with uh, the school of, the school of Politics, Andreas Fulda. Um, I, I was delighted to hear you mention a couple of uh, uh, keywords like stripping bureaucracy, emphasizing the need for subsidiarity and uh, accountability, obviously. Um, in very practical terms, uh, could you speak a little bit about um, this tension between, let's say, centralization that has been going on maybe for the past five to ten, maybe even twenty years, not just here in Nottingham, but also in other higher education institutions, and maybe the need for decentralization. And uh, I'm going to be very open about that. I think uh, maybe the schools uh, need to be uh, strengthened again against, um, let's say, faculty or uh, even UEB. And so maybe you could comment on, on that and also address you know, how we can um, maybe um, streamline our governance structure in this regard. Thank you. Sure. Re reforms to governance sound easy, but they're never easy. And just to say we're going to be less central and have more subsidiarities, it, it doesn't happen overnight. Um, I think some things have to be done centrally. I put my compliance burden thing up there. You know, if, 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 we, um, if we devolved um, procurement, if we devolved um, UKVI compliance, we would be in, in trouble. So there's certain things we have to pull into the centre and there's certain decisions we have to make as a university. What I would like to do, uh, we've had to do that too because we've grown very fast over a very short period of time. What I would like to be able to do is to see how we can begin to m map out our governance and decision-making processes so we can um, push more decisions down that need to be going down. Now, you mentioned the schools. I don't know which niche of Orsan Michele that you're, you're, you're in, but, um, but I, I think the schools are hugely important to the university because that's where research and education gets done. But, but we have to operate within certain frameworks in order to be sustainable and for, in order for us to you know, be successful. So getting that balance right is not a quick fix. It's a slow, careful process of consideration. And you, know, it, you may not notice a change next week or even next year, but if we, if we can move along that path, I think things will feel different in, in, in due course. So thank you. And I think as well in your comments, you made a couple of very important points that in that, in that process, uh, the notions of accountability and yes. responsibility Correct. are yeah. absolutely integral to how you can transmit 
exactly. uh, or devolve activity and decision making, right? That's absolutely right, Andrew. And I, and I think, I think when, I, when I hear people saying it's too centralised, we want more down at school level or whatever level it is, um, I think that that accountability is going to have to come with it. That would be my only thing. And that is quite a, you know, yeah. that's, that can be the downside. Yeah. And, and, and the, the other theme, again, you referred to, although not quite in this context, is risk tolerance, yeah. which is a decision for the university maker. It's also a decision for the policy makers to make office of students. So, yeah, so exactly. often, oftentimes the centralization is driven by a, a complete um, lack of risk tolerance yeah. and a perception that you can, you can create perfect control by centralizing. Yeah. That isn't particularly true, no. but it is a belief. And, yeah. and I think having an active and open discussion around what your risk tolerance, how many failures are you prepared to tolerate yeah. before you, you have to make a change. Is a, it's a really difficult thing to engage is, in, yeah. but you have to be realistic. It's gonna, that risks happen, yep. failures do happen, yep. and you have to then build your system around that design. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree with you. It's why I showed that wonderful slide with little balls going around. Yeah. You, yeah. You, you can't really control anything like that. So, yeah, I agree. Um, I had a question in the middle of, yeah, please, uh, chat, uh, yeah, there we go. <coughs> Hi, I'm uh, Steve Howdle. I'm the new head of School of Chemistry. Um, been in post about the same time as you have, Sheila. <laughs> Thank you for a lovely lecture. Um, some messages that came through there were really strong. And I, I wanted to say that, you know, I'm, I'm passionate about teaching and I'm passionate about research. And so are many of my colleagues. But my colleagues report back that they sometimes feel like they just can't balance the two. Uh, and they're walking in treacle with a lot of the admin that we have to deal with and some of the things that are, are kind of falling about, uh, falling down around them. I think this is something that I'd like to see addressed and many of the things you said uh, in, your, in your lecture there pointed towards that. Um, and also on the, on the teaching side and the student engagement side, um, you know, I'm, I'm not a Luddite, I embrace the technology. Many of us use Echo 360 now. It's a, it's a nice way of recording the lectures and, and the students can watch them later and, and revise from them. But actually, you know, we do get many of the students who now don't come to the lectures. And, and this gets a little bit frustrating. And I try to tell them, you know, if, if your favorite band was on at Rock City in town, would you rather be there or would you rather watch it on YouTube later? <laughs> so I try to get them to come for the student experience. But the students are changing. Uh, but I want to make sure they still get that experience in the future. I just wanted your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um, I, the teaching research issue, I think, is an interesting one. I, I think we, when, uh, when it suits us, we talk about being a research, doing research-led teaching. And I think that, to me, that's important that we continue to do that. Um, I think the problem is the third thing that you mentioned. I mean, we all do have to do a certain amount of management, a certain amount of administration. I think the burden of that has increased um, exponentially in recent years and I think that it's that is from my point of view making people feel that they can't balance the teaching and research demands so again as with governance you, you can't rip away um, all the layers all at once but I do think I, I'm, I'm very much an advocate of, of lean um, lean theory that, that if you map your processes and you ask yourself what is normalized weirdness in this and, and what do we have to do, you know? And actually, people say we have to do it that way, and we have to add that process, and it, they accrete. And, and, I, and so one thing I, I'm talking to my colleagues about a bit is how we can get that process improvement, that lean methodology, deep inside our systems so that we free time for people to do more teaching, more research, more knowledge exchange, rather than filling in forms. And I'm, you know, again, it's not, it's going to be a slow burn rather than a quick fix. But I think you're right. Tim. Uh, thank you, Vice Chancellor. Yeah, another question in from Twitter. Uh, Carol Steed, head of our Leadership uh, Academy. She's actually um, paused the leadership training session to, uh, to watch the uh, presentation today. Um, the question is, uh, you are clearly setting out a, a new leadership tone. Uh, what do you think is important for our leaders at all levels to focus on bringing this to life? Okay, um, that is a hard question, um, Carol. And I should thank Carol for one of the slides that I showed, which I didn't acknowledge at the time. Um, how do we do it? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a really strong believer in, in distributed leadership, that leadership happens at all stages of your life and career, sometimes in very small ways. 
and that we shouldn't just think of it as the people who have titles. And I guess um, Carol runs our Leadership and Management Academy, and I, I guess that that's partly what, what we're trying to do here is to instill that, those notions of leadership. It can be a dirty word in higher education. It can be kind of equated with Stalinism or something, but actually it's, it, it's, it's something that is really important in terms of leading by example, um, role modeling behavior, and I think that we've got to really be thinking about that. So it's a big question that Carol asked, but those, that's the kind of general way, I think, along, along the lines of leadership. Thank you. Um, yeah, I had um, a lady, right-hand side, yeah. Thanks. Hello, um, Laura Beelan Kelly, uh, Equal Opportunities and Welfare Officer at the Students' Union. Um, thank you, first of all, for your um, really riveting lecture, Shira. Um, so you mentioned at the very beginning um, an increase in mental health concerns, sexual harassment and hate crime as some of the kind of key um, challenges for the HE sector at the moment. I'm wondering what do you see as the University of Nottingham's role in kind of tackling these issues on our campuses? Such a good question. Um, and I wish I had a really glib answer to it, but I don't, because these, these issues are huge, and um, we have got to spend a lot more time thinking about what to do about them. I think we've got to use our imagination a lot more as well. It, it feels to me like we've got into a vicious cycle where things just keep getting worse and worse, and, and we put more you know, resource towards trying to solve a problem that's already happened, rather than trying to prevent it from happening in the first place. And so I think where our, and I, I don't know the answer to this myself, and again, this is why we have all you wonderful people in the university to help. Um, what we really need to do, what practical steps that we can take to begin to work with prevention of some of these terrible problems, rather than then just having to pick up the pieces when everything falls apart. And there was a, I think there was a second, yes, next to you, yeah. Hi, my name is Lauren Caracul. I'm a second year international media communication student as well as the SU International Part-Time Officer. Um, I was reading your little portfolio on the pamphlets on our seat and ideally I saw that you took your undergrad in the US and I'm taking mine in the UK. So I'm the reciprocal version of you. My question goes back to the international student experience and how do you plan on using your role as vice chancellor to lobby larger sluggish agencies of change to target the burdens of bureaucracy, bureaucracy that challenge my capabilities as well as other international students to obtain the quality of lifelong learning that we desire? And ideally, the short version of this question, what is your next plan of action to improve and sustain a positive international student experience that the University of Nottingham has already achieved so well? What a good question. <laughs> what, a, what a good question. I think we have to start by um, really uh, talking a bit more to our international students and to you as their representative and understanding where some of the problems are. I mean, I, and some of the things that we need to tackle are. Um, so um, I, I think that, I, I think we maybe have a tendency in the UK certainly, and I, to China and Malaysia possibly to a lesser extent, um, to just think a student as a student comes into campus, we give them all the great experience we give them, and not to take enough account of the cultural adjustments that have to happen uh, with students coming from a different country, as I did, as you did, um, and where things are not what you'd expect them to be. And, and so I don't have a, I, I wish I had a, a set of practical lists to give you now. Again, I'm new in post. But I think that to me this is part of my whole thinking about how we become a more inclusive community culturally um, in, in, in having people think very hard about what adjustments students who come to different campuses from other places are having to make, not just to the experience, but to the way we teach our intellectual environment, our, our weather, and uh, all sorts of things. I think it's a great answer, a terrific question. You and I had a couple, a couple of hours together with your colleagues uh, a few weeks ago where you took me through what the student union's doing in this space. And I think the union really should be congratulated for the work it's doing here. And, and one of the things that is so striking is that this, getting this right starts from the minute somebody steps off the airplane or however they arrive. 
way before they get to the university and, and really just sort of walking in the steps of what it's like to be an 18 year old or however old somebody is who arrives in this country, never been here before, maybe never left their country. Yeah, and I think the, the student union is doing an absolutely terrific job of that. I'd, I'd also say there's something really inspirational about rethinking how to make that international student's life work brilliantly here will inform us how to make you know, the millennial, gen the digitized student life brilliant. Because it's not just about where, it's, to your point of diversity and inclusion, it's not just where you come from, it's your background, it's your outlook. And if we, if we want to make all sorts of difference equally capable to add potential, then we've got to kind of figure out how to walk in each of those lives, not just in the international student. Yeah. But I think a lot of what can be learned from the international student process, we can apply elsewhere. Can I just do a footnote anecdote? Um, when I went to do my PhD in St. Andrews, um, and I, I grew up in a small town in America, did, went to a state university, I, I took the train from Edinburgh to Lukers, having flown for 24 hours to get there, arrived at Lukers station, and for those of you who don't know Scotland, it's an RAF base that's near there, and nothing else. There's some fields as far as the eye can see. And I got off the train, I was all by myself, and an RAF, RAF plane flew over my head, and I thought, what in the world am I doing? And so, you know, it is just little things like that. Um, Nobody met me, you know, and it was, it was really, it's quite interesting, actually. Great. We're going to take uh, one last question. That lady on the left-hand side, yes. Yeah. Yeah. My left. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Cassie Abor, the Education Officer, also from the Students' Union. Um, it's really exciting to see your dedication to equality and diversity, as well as being the first female vice chancellor appointed here at the University of Nottingham. But recent LEO data shows that our female graduates are often earning less than their male counterparts. And I'm just wondering, what do you believe the university's responsibility is to help close this gap? Sorry, you're saying our female graduates are not achieving as much as their male They're counterparts? They're earning, earning less. Earning less, sure. yes, earning less. Um, well, I mean, I think, that, I think that's a really good question, Cassie, and it, like the BME attainment gap, we really shouldn't be um, seeing th that kind of gap in pay coming to our students who go into the workplace. I, I think that we have a brilliant careers and employability office here, I'm, I'm, that's, you know, personal bias, but I think one of the things that we, we need to be looking at, and I'm sure they are looking at it, is what is causing that. Because you can't solve a problem until you know what's causing it. And, and I think there probably are a number of things we can do within the university to help um, prepare our women students to, you know, to, to go out there and you know, compete for the same types of employment. And if they're not doing it, why are they not doing it? Because they're just as able. Their degrees are just as good. So I think we need to start by understanding what the problem is and what, what the blocks are, and whether it's the employers or whether it's something that we need to do or intervene with earlier on. And I would be really pleased to work with you on that. Thank you. Great, we have one last question from the Stratosphere. <laughs> uh, yeah, I thought um, this would be a, a very good uh, final question for today. Um, it's from Professor Chris Rudd, uh, Provost at our Ningbo campus. Uh, as follows, uh, Nottingham was famous in the past decade because of MRI. It is famous in this decade because of the international campuses. What will it be famous for? in the next decade? Oh, uh, yeah, it's a trust Chris to ask me an impossible question. Um, I, I don't know, but I, I think that, uh, the, I go back to my final slide, that, that I think that we could do anything. And um, I, I think it would be um, probably premature of me to say what we're going to be remembered for um, after I'm long gone. But I think Chris's question was, was a very good one. So. And on that rather vague note. <laughs> I'm going to ask you one more thing. So, okay. uh, so you're, you're taking over a very big organization, yep. 45,000 yep. students, 9,000, 250,000 alumni. Um, when people take over jobs like yours, they often describe the experience as it's like drinking from a fire hose. So you have this enormous <laughs> inbound, and in fact, the, even, the, even the, the, uh, the breadth of the issues which we just heard yeah. reflected that. So let me ask you, how can the people in the room and listening to this, how can they help you in the first year or so? So what would be, what, how, how would it be, 
how could they help you yeah. get through this this agenda of de of needs and desires as efficiently as possible? Well, it's a, it's a great question, Andrew, and, and I, I would say that I already feel very helped by people I've seen in the university. I've I've spent a couple of months visiting all the schools and departments. I've nearly finished. And um, a lot of the things that have been raised there have given me a bit better understanding of the culture and the nature of Nottingham University. So that's help for a start. But in simplest terms, I think solution-focused rather than problem-focused. Yeah. So when, I, when people raise a problem, um, which is a real problem, I need help as a vice chancellor and my U university executive board needs help to understand what we really ought to do about it. So to get the wisdom and advice of colleagues for solutions rather than just problems is what I, yeah. people could do to help me the most. I think, that's, I think that's a great message. And I'd encourage everybody you know, to share that with your colleagues uh, who aren't in the room. Uh, and I'd add one last thing, having been in a, you know, in a different uh, parallel universe to academia, a similar role, materiality. So, so sometimes, uh, you get a lot of requests. Sometimes it's just the problem. Sometimes the problem comes with a solution. I think there's an obligation on all of us to be, to be thoughtful about the materiality of your concern to the bigger agenda of the organization. It's impossible to do 10 million things at the same time. It is possible to do a few things brilliantly at the same time. It's all about getting that focus, figuring out what the solution is, and then getting the, the things that really matter right. And that's something which very often is, is kind of left to the management, if I can put it that way. Um, but it, I think in a modern environment, it really has to be a shared responsibility where, where everybody's really been thoughtful about, yes, we want to improve, but here's the priorities, here's the materiality test that we should be focused on. With that, Cher, I think you uh, did a terrific job today. It was a really, uh, a really energizing uh, lecture. I think it, uh, I can't imagine that anybody has listened to you and isn't leaving uh, full of ideas and, and maybe a few people a little nervous, which is probably not a bad thing either. So it's, it's always good to get the adrenaline flowing early in your tenure. So I think you've probably achieved that. Thank and, you. and I, I, and I, I suspect that what you've done is what you wanted to do is to just maybe just encourage a little bit of restlessness, a little bit of aspiration in the broader church of the university. And, and uh, I'm sure you've done that beautifully today. Uh, I enjoyed every, every minute of it, and it was great to hear you answer the questions, not just from here in Nottingham, but from Malaysia and China as well. Thank you so much. Congratulations on your appointment. Thank you. And we're going to look forward to seeing what you will be remembered for many years from today. So <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you, you everybody. Thank, thank you very much.